Thanks. All right, hello, welcome everyone to the Q&A with the Gutenberg team. Uh, my name is Tofu Matt, um, and I just started working at Automatic like a month or so ago, so I know nothing. I'm greener than anyone in this room, which will make me hopefully a good moderator, because I understand nothing and I don't get anything, so you know, no question is too stupid. Uh, just so everyone knows, we're going to split this thing into sort of three sections. The first one is going to be a Q&A with the team. We have, I think, a grand total of three questions that people submitted beforehand. So got lots of time. If you have any questions about Gutenberg, um, you can ask them now to this you know, great panel of people. After that, uh, we're going to do a little bit of talks about like blocks and plug-in APIs and stuff. Matthias is going to be doing one of those. And after that, we'll take another break, and then we'll uh, kind of actually build. Are you going to build a block or build a plugin or what's happening? Both? OK, yeah. So if you want to build a, your first block or your first plugin, uh, I'm going to try to build mine because I've never done one, as mentioned. Very green. Uh, I'm getting some feedback. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll do that at the end. Um, so if everyone on the team wants to introduce themselves first, I think that was the deal. We'll go in this order. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Gary. Uh, I uh, work on Gutenberg, work on Core, work on Emoji. Um, and uh, yes, I don't quite know what we're going to talk about yet, but let's go with intros. Hi, I'm Tammy. I'm design lead for Gutenberg. And I'm looking forward to this workshop with everyone. Uh, hello, welcome everyone. I'm Matthias. I'm the tech lead for Gutenberg. Hello, my name is Grzegorz, and I'm a JavaScript runner working on the team Gutenberg. Hi, I'm Ella. I work on Gutenberg. <laughs> hey, I'm uh, Robert, and I'm a JavaScript engineer working on Gutenberg full time. Hey, I'm Josh Kost, and surprise, surprise, I also a JavaScript <laughs> engineer working for Gutenberg. Hello, I'm Riyad. I'm developer on Gutenberg, mostly JavaScript. Hi, uh, I'm Andrew Duffy. I'm a developer as well. JavaScript specialization. So if you have any PHP questions, this is the team to ask. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we only have a, a couple of questions to start with. Um, the first two submitted are pretty much the same. I think the first one is kind of a troll question, and it's, uh, when will it, and I assume it is Gutenberg, uh, move to core? But the second question is, what is the criteria to decide that Gutenberg is ready to be included in a WordPress release? So I think really it's just like, when is it going to move to core? What's stopping it from moving it to core? Feel free to answer. Um, well, for the first part, when will it come to core? I mean, we've got three hours now, so how about we do it now? <laughs> so it's... Um, it's kind of, it's, if you look at uh, the recent releases of Gutenberg, then they're, uh, they're a lot more stable. They're a lot more about polish and iterating on uh, existing behavior. It's, um, there, there are a few, a few new features still, still to be done, but it's getting pretty close to, to being able to say it's feature complete. So I think that we'll be, we're looking at um, moving towards like the merge type phase of this in, over the next few months. Uh, I would definitely attend uh, Matt's talk this afternoon. Uh, I don't want to give anything away, but he might have some more information about that too. Um, sh just to add to that, the, the main focus for the, the plugin now is to get to that feature-free state, uh, meaning uh, we think that within the next, I don't know, three, we are in 3.0 now. We have 3.1 almost ready to come out. Um, maybe around 3.3 .3 or something like that, we can call it. That, that's it about features, and we focus purely on refining the, the current experience. We can stabilize all the APIs, and uh, that's kind of the focus right now. Um, I don't know, like a bare estimate around that is that um, <coughs> we could get to that feature-free state in June, or maybe the first week of July, something like that. And, and then we'll see from there. OK, cool. So uh, in terms of criteria, though, is there any concrete criteria? Or is it just you know, making sure that there's no more bugs? You know, what does feature complete mean? Feature complete with like current editor? What? Just, you know. Yeah, th there's. Th 
Hello? Hey. There's, a, there's a, a GitHub issue that's an MVP issue that's been around for some time uh, that has some pending tasks. Um, it's a, like the, the, there are many, many of the final features have arisen from the feedback loop from developers and users. Uh, so so some of the features that were not necessarily planned for V1 became apparent that they were needed for V1 because they either improve the developer experience drastically or they allow developers to do things they couldn't do before um, or they sort of connect different areas that, and I'm talking about things like, uh, like child blocks. Child blocks wasn't something that we originally planned for V1. Um, it wasn't even conceptualized as a thing, uh, but within the last four or five months it became apparent that this was both possible, relatively easy to accomplish, and it would allow developers to be much more expressive in how they can build blocks and stuff. Um, so there's, there's a bit of like a, a fixed set of things that we want to get to, um, and that goes back to the introduction of the project, uh, like the block-based editing experience, but then when you get into the finer details, some of those pieces have been uh, moving around based on the both user testing, user feedback, and developer feedback. Um, I think we're at, we're at a point now where um, there's nothing on the horizon that's, um, that we still have to get to. Um, just to be very brief, the remaining features that we consider features that need to land are like inline images. Uh, we need to get that in. Uh, we have some minor things like post locking if there are concurrent users editing a post. Um, Server registration of blocks is not, it's already possible, it's not technically a feature, but we need to do some refinements there. Um, I have the list. If you have the, uh, the issue number, can share it with people and they can look at that at least yeah, as well. Yeah, it's 4894. 4894. I'll write it up here in case people forget. Yeah. So if you go to Gutenberg, 49? 48. All right, so the answer to your question is there on GitHub. <laughs> cool. All right, so we have one more question, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, the question is, is there a specific plan to implement customization or live previewing to the new editor experience once uh, Gutenberg is in core? It says after it's been merged into core. So just in general, live previewing, customization, is that a plan? So we already have direct manipulation, which is an interesting word to say this time in the morning. Uh, so we already have that. So we have a step on that kind of what you see is what you get road. Phase two of Gutenberg is customization. And that's when a lot of what people kind of think of as site building kind of, and page building more happens. Phase one is content editing. That's what we're focusing on purely as the editor. And then it kind of expands out to that. But some of the groundwork has already been laid within the first phase. And so the first phase also has to include I kind of think it like we have to provide the Lego before you build the house. That's how my brain works. So we were kind of already starting that in, in that sense. And there's already been some explorations and some kind of prototypes about that work. Um, there's also some issues already on GitHub for widgets to become blocks. So that's like a, a step towards that kind of site building experience. Yeah, yeah and I think that the other so the, the the way the whole process was planned was to have these three phases, basically, like the editor, customization, and site building. Uh, but in reality, it's more like a continuum. And if, for example, in Gutenberg, we already have access to templates. We have uh, nested blocks, all elements that were primarily the foundational blocks for customization. Um, they are not being, I mean, we have a columns block in, in Gutenberg that's been experimental for for the most part, uh, but the main driver was to have the infrastructure necessary to support those kind of things, because those are the necessary building blocks for customization. Uh, so in, in a way, it has already, the plan was to overlap the different uh, focuses, and there's already many elements of customization that have been uh, trickling in into the, the, the first version. Um, the, proper focus into V2 is going to be to just expand beyond the post content area. Cool. Okay, so those are the only three questions that we had pre-submitted. Um, gonna open the floor, 
questions. So uh, anybody here who wants, yeah. Uh, first of all, if you need a microphone, um, please speak into the mic because otherwise it won't get recorded into the AV setup. Oh, thank you. Um, and to encourage you to ask questions, I will be giving out one Gutenberg sticker uh, for every question. Um, just one. And if it's a bad question, actually, you won't get it. I said there were no stupid questions, but if everybody looks, no, I'm just joking. Anyway, so question right here. Hi, good morning. Um, so the, the whole Gutenberg approach um, was for many users kind of radical because uh, when the new editor was announced, everyone was thinking about replacing uh, TinyMC and uh, what uh, the team eventually did was nah, like, nah, we're going to replace the whole edit screen. And uh, why did you do that? What was the problem you tried to solve that made the solution so radical? Yeah, so I kind of got a question first of you. When you say users, what do you mean by that? Like what type of users? Because I think that's important when we use that word, we have to be a bit specific because there's a lot of different people that use WordPress in lots of amazing different ways. Uh, so I think that that's kind of interesting to kind of think about in this terms and the the level and a lot of people don't even know that tiny NC exists to them see the screen that they write in that's all it is but we also then have to take a step back if you think about a lot of the experiences beyond WordPress WordPress is amazing but also there's a world outside WordPress and that world outside WordPress uh, doing some pretty awesome things with apps and with editing and we don't have that as, as an ecosystem, WordPress, we kind of have it a little bit with site builders, but what we're doing is everybody is having to build on top of this foundation of WordPress that hasn't really changed and hasn't really adapted to all this stuff and amazing technologies and moving forward and experience improvements outside of WordPress. So that really is the crux point. We have to change to go for the next 10 years. WordPress has to adapt, has to become and has to have all these tools and experiences that people can build on top of. And really that's like at the heart of it. And that's not just for the, the users that know that TinyMCE exists. That's for every single type of person and human. Human is a better word than users as well, um, who interact on different from enterprise who are doing incredible things that have to stick things together with WordPress like Jenga because they have to work around WordPress and developers who have to develop the WordPress way because WordPress gets in the way of them developing. So that's kind of, I think we kind of need to have that thought when we kind of approach it. So radical needs to sometimes happen to move forward. And also we have to kind of go back to the foundation to look at, at to respond to what's happening outside. Um, yeah, and I, I completely agree. And uh, the other thing is that when the first time the focus was announced by Matt in WordCamp US like almost two years ago, um, it just mentioned the editor. And to Tammy's term, like to regular users, the editor is the whole screen in which you're editing. Um, I think it was more of a internal WordPress confusion that that we say, oh, the editor is just tiny MC. Um, also because if you like this project started two years ago almost uh, but it's it's like it's a long tail that started with uh, I think it was 3.6 the post formats um, like wh when we started to revamp the interface around post formats in core that was touching the whole editor as well like it was adding like a tumblr like experience where you would choose which format you would start with um, so it's always an and that process ended up in the notion of maybe what we should do is something like content blocks. And that was left at that, like in 2012 or 13. Um, but it was always touching the whole interface because the, one of the main problems that Gutenberg seeks to solve is that in WordPress you have too many ways of doing things and affecting the content of your post. Um, and that's not always intuitive and it's not consistent. You have things like short codes, tiny MC plugins, meta boxes. There are many meta boxes that are used as blocks effectively. Uh, you have like this 
slideshows for the header area of your site that's a meta box. Like, there are multiple ways in which developers have find ways to do things that WordPress natively wasn't really optimized for doing through these avenues. So we, WordPress in many ways was already doing blogs. It was just in a very cumbersome and not very intuitive way. Um, so sort of aligning all those items under a single interface was one of the main goals, and that requires looking at the whole screen. Um, especially because we want, to bo we want to move forwards to a more um, fully visual experience that's representative of the full site, we can't do that in the tiny, tiny MC window. Like we have to look at the, we have to make the content the front and center space for all of those things to happen. And, and also to stimulate the imagination of developers when they have the canvas and they can build blocks as the front and center piece of the user interactions, I think we're already seeing from multiple plugins that there are many cool things that are coming up that weren't really possible before because you couldn't rely on the, either the, the interface wasn't even consistent because you could move meta boxes around, some people didn't have the right sidebar meta boxes. It was just every setup was slightly different, so it was very hard to optimize for that experience. Um, also, if you like the very first mockups that Yoen released already included the whole screen. So I think it was, yeah, to just to answer the, the point, I think it was just a confusion in how we interpreted the terms editor at the time. Uh, but, but I think it's come around quite a bit. I think people have realized uh, why it makes sense to think of the whole experience holistically and not just in terms of what's the rich text editing feature that's powering this tiny window. Cool. Uh, next question, hands up. One over there. Uh. And, and thanks for the oh. question. <laughs> Hi, thank you, good morning. Um, could you maybe walk us through what actually is gonna happen when we're gonna flick the update switch to 5.0? So what, what is that gonna happen with the, with the content, with the existing sites, uh, stuff like that? Should we be afraid that everything's gonna break or what? Uh so I think there's, there's a few things there. Uh, so when, when 5.0 is released, so it, for starters, it won't be an auto update. Uh, it's currently not possible to auto to for us to even push out auto updates of major releases um, so it's not like you're going to uh, wake up one morning and uh, there's a new pr new present on your website saying, uh, good morning here's a completely new editing experience so it's it's certainly a case of um, particularly if you if you have more complex sites that you can uh, you can take some time to ensure that uh, if you have a testing site, then it's running on there before you then apply the upgrade to your production site. Uh, but it's also the case of, to, for existing content, um, Gutenberg, uh, the, the block editor, won't, um, it won't go and change all of the content on the site. Uh, it's just, your content will just continue to exist in the database as it is. Um, when you then, uh, when you open a post in the site, uh, when you open a post in, in the editor, then uh, you'll have the option to convert that to, to the block format. Um, and then, uh, and so that will then work in the, in the, new, uh, in the new block editor way. But um, e even then, if, it's, if it doesn't quite work, then you're able to uh, fall back to the classic editor as well. All right. Cool. So it sounds like content itself doesn't get changed, just the editing experience by default. Okay. Uh, next question over there. Can can I add one small thing to the? I wanted Fine. to share. <laughs> now I, uh, we we went to great lengths to make sure that we introduced the notion of blocks without altering how WordPress deals with data. That that was in part to make this transition as seamless as possible. It's what allowed us to. We it's almost it's literally a year since the first version of the plugin, and through all that process, people could either install it. And if they didn't like it, they could add install it, and it didn't change their content structure. So that was, that was very important to make sure that this process was possible, and it's one of the cornerstones so that we can allow people to upgrade without, without fragmenting their, their content structure. That was one of the main, main goals of the whole project. Yeah. So. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, Thank you for yeah, the very mic. quick. Uh, just a short uh, question. Oh, sorry. I was just going to add one tiny, oh, tiny, tiny, tiny thing um, to answer because you said, "Should people be afraid?" I think it's important that there will be lots of information about this, so it's not going to be something that's, as I said, that's just going to appear. There will be information. There will be posts on Make. There will be other information resources. We're going to, as a project, really make sure that everybody knows what they have to know and then can make that decision and kind of move forward from it. So I just want to respond to, because you said afraid, that's like a, a, a position. I just want to kind of respond to that for you. OK, thanks. Uh, just a short question. Uh, when uh, Gutenberg is finally integrated and when you have all the options and features and everything, uh, do you think it will actually kill some of those page builders? And uh, is that some kind of intention to you know, bring uh, visual builders' uh, capabilities into WordPress? So I'm just going to quickly, and then I'll pass it. <laughs> uh, I don't think we should be doing that to anything. Um, the way that I see it is, um, as I've mentioned, providing an awesome base that then, uh, pay, pay, depending on what you call page or site builders, the two terms that you ask the same people that have different responses to what they mean, but all of those type building type applications, theme or plugin, they're going to be able to see that as a springboard to just go and shoot for the kind of the moon with that, and that's the exciting thing. I see it as and enabling them to flourish and get even more capability, even more awesomeness <laughs> uh, from it rather than changing, uh, like rather than removing them. There will be a base level within uh, WordPress, but there's always going to be, a, in, in the core product, there's always going to be space in that environment for experimentation, for different ways, and, and that's what makes WordPress amazing. So I don't see it as not having that type of thing around. I see it as enabling them to just be even better than they are and for everybody to benefit from that. Yeah, and, and we've been in chat with many of the page builders people and it's been, it's been exciting for them as well because they, like, they've taken upon themselves to solve something that WordPress wasn't providing. Uh, but ideally, they wouldn't want to be solving like some of the fundamental problems. Ideally, WordPress would provide the common framework for these page builders to exist. I think there's totally room for people that say, no, I think this interface for editing block is better than core, or I, or I have a more like niche approach, and for this kind of user, I think this other approach is better. But we can still be sharing the, the, the foundational block and make sure that the user, which is what matters the most, that they are not locked into a different page builder and they can move around if they need to and that we can support them for like the next decade or two or whatever. Um, I, think that, I think that's super important. I can see some page builders feeling that they can focus their energies on things like building blocks or uh, building very specific blocks that they, they have a lot of experience in how the um, and how their user base, what are the needs for their user base. So they can probably refocus some of that effort in, in some of those areas. Um, also, also around themes, like they can, a lot of the page builders started from theme shops. Like they can, maybe they can refocus their energy on, on what sort of put them there in the first place, which is uh, the whole visual aspect of the whole site experience. Um, and ideally that's something that unifies the different page builders, we can share the same the same structure for blogs. It's it's going to be a portable mechanism. If you switch themes, you won't be you won't be losing everything that you did. That's that's kind of the goal. So I think it, it's very complementary. I don't think uh, I don't think they will be going away, but I think they they will have a chance to to avoid many of the pitfalls that they have, which is the content lock in primarily. Cool. Uh, next question. Back there. Hello. Um, I was wondering if we could have a rundown of uh, the initiative we have in both code-wise and training-wise on how to enhance adoption of uh, Gutenberg once it lands in core and when it's released. Uh, I mean in this both in terms of users, so what they're going to get when they get a new interface, and both for developers. How can we help developers get experience with it? Thank you. 
so I think we're we're already starting to see it in the wider ecosystem already. There are a lot of uh, a lot of courses and tutorials and uh, and that kind of thing that have uh, that people have been creating in order to in order to help you um, uh, learn how to do these cool new things. Um, there's also the um, uh, the WordPress training team have been working on some um, on some training material for uh, to help at WordCamps and uh, for people to be able to do um, to do these sessions. They're, we're working on tutorials to uh, free tutorials to be able to learn how to uh, to build to build new content, but also to take your existing uh, existing features, your existing plugins and themes, and to convert them to work in this new. Uh, uh, this new blocky way. Uh, so certainly training material is an important part of it. Uh, and also once for, for the people who are actually uh, using, the, using the site and creating the content, um, it's certainly it's a new experience, but it's still, it's familiar. And I think we're, we're also looking at, um, at ways to, uh, to introduce people to this new, uh, to this new experience as well. So within Goombag itself, we've got something that um, I think it might come in the next release uh, called Tips, which is uh, an attempt to just start to answer the new user experience problem. Uh, it's experimental, and that's part of Gutenberg. We just we could be trying something. We have that freedom within a plugin to try something, see see what the feedback is, and um, basically in the really small form, it's just a little story walkthrough that says, hey, this is the publishing flow, this is what you need to do to add a block. An advanced version of that, which is being proposed and we possibly as a project might work on, is to have, um, I don't know if anyone's ever used like Vimeo or anything where as you're using it, little tips of, hey, you're using it in this way, have you thought about doing something like this? Those little, I call them like helpful nudges, those kind of little advances that as you learn, you get better at using that interface. So that could be something explored, uh, potentially, and we have the groundwork to do that. That also can then translate to WordPress as a project, because WordPress itself, anybody using WordPress for the first time, I don't know if you've ever experienced someone using it for the first time, I mean, you did as well, but that might have been a long time ago. Uh, but actually watching someone for the first time, there's a, a bemused puzzlement on their face as they're trying to navigate the way through the things that we all appreciate and we all understand. So just being able to have that, that little story nudge and that, that guide through is a way that we can work with Gutenberg uh, to really try and make a welcoming interface that is something that can be picked up as well. So that's kind of several approaches. One, we have the training, we have also the, the education. I know the marketing team are working on even approaches of how do agencies uh, that kind of say this to their clients, all of those kind of discussions. And then we also have within the interface itself, trying to have that guiding, that, that welcome as well. Uh, anything else? No? Next question. Back there. How do you see the nature of a theme building changing with Gutenberg? I'm going to start, but I've got a feeling that everybody's going to have an opinion on that, which is awesome. Uh, so I'm going to start from a personal place. I would like, personally, themes to get back to doing what they're good at, which is being themes, not trying to be everything. And that's kind of what we've had, that, that working around WordPress, we've had to do that, and themes have suffered at the hands of that practice that we've had to do. Themes really are amazing at styling the front end. That's what they're amazing at. And also providing an editor style so that you can have that near what you see is what you get experience. So we have that within Gutenberg. We have the ability to bring those styles from the theme to the kind of visual editor itself. So that's kind of what I, I mean, where it goes is what happens when, when we release something where the community adopts. Another aspect that I've already seen um, is releasing a suite of blocks with a plugin, which is a really exciting kind of potential way forward. So you would have a theme, maybe it's for a certain type, uh, maybe it's for a type of business, and then you would have a suite of blocks that go with that. So 
you get that kind of capacity. It's not putting it in functions, it's not putting it in custom post types, it's having those blocks as well. So there's lots of kind of exciting. I also see it more going in the sense of a style guide, which is something a lot of people already do with agency work and really having that reflected within the editor itself and themes just being a lot lighter as a result of that. Yes. Um, so I think um, as far as, so well, at uh, State of the Word last year, uh, Matt was talking about the, uh, the three phases of, of Gutenberg, content, the content editing, customization, and theming. So um, it's certainly I can see there's, there's potential for significant changes to theming, but it's important to, to remember that as with everything with WordPress, backwards compatibility is critical. So existing themes will continue to work, will continue to function, you'll still be able to build themes that way. But there's, with this, uh, it's a time of renewal, with this building this base for the next 10 or 15 or 20 years of developing WordPress, then we can also look at what, what would happen if we were to uh, redesign a theming API from the ground up. And as Tammy was saying, uh, letting themers focus on building the theme rather than needing to, needing to care about laying out all their PHP files right and getting, getting all of the strange, pe all, the, all the theme tags and what have you laid out. So I think um, providing that, uh, um, so crea creating a new API is certainly potentially on the cards. Um, I think it's a little bit early to, um, uh, to be saying exactly what that will end up like, but um, there, there have been some there have been some experiments, um, and certainly once once they're a little more fully formed, I expect that we'll um, uh, we'll be seeing more discussion of that in the in the wider community. But as as always, these things are kind of open for open for discussion and open for input uh, at any time. Okay, Mat Matthias seems to want to share his screen and show us something, so. No, I was just trying to know what Tammy was mentioning about the tips with a uh, question or two before. Okay. Um, that kind of, that's what's going to go in the next release, and it's basically a system to sort of guide the users through the interface. Um, and it should be extensible as well, so we can, um, yeah, that's pretty much. You can switch it back. Cool, uh, next question. Uh, back there. You next, I promise. All right. <laughs> uh, so my question is, do you think in any time soon the, the Gutenberg editor will replace the customizer? Uh, so the, ne the next phase of, of Gutenberg's uh, after WordPress 5.0, or perhaps a little bit, there'll be a bit of crossover, is, um, is looking at what, the, what a block-based customization experience would look like. So... Uh, part of that will likely involve uh, replacing the customizer, but uh, interestingly, I think that in terms of, particularly in terms of uh, backwards compatibility, um, uh, it would it's potentially a lot easier. The customizer being JavaScript based, uh, having um, uh, having some more modern, uh, cleaner APIs to it, um, will will potentially be easier to take where you, where you already hook into the customizer to add functionality, then it's potentially something that could be hooked straight into whatever a good uh, customization looks like rather than uh, needing to rewrite, uh, rewrite so much. Certainly it will, it will be a case of the best experience will, will, involve, um, will involve updating your updating code to match the, um, to match the new style and the new, uh, new designs, but it's, um, it's a thing that I think we can uh, do a lot of work to smooth the transition. Uh, up here. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my question is about the uh, columns block, which was introduced uh, recently. Um, there is, uh, I think, a still open uh, issue on GitHub about the fact that this is very useful for you know, advanced layout options. However, it's not responsive. And it's not clear to me what is the direction in this uh, in this regard? Because pretty much any other visual builder, you know, founds on having uh, the possibilities to have multiple columns and decide what happens at different breakpoints. So, what's going to be with that? Thank you. Thank you for your question. And hi, <laughs> I think it's important to step back a tiny bit and say this is the phase one of the editor, 
And I think it's it's so because it's also quite fully formed, right? It's so to make that assumption that we need to have everything working in phase one is, is something we maybe need to kind of change a little bit. I will say with columns, it really is uh, experimental. It's been flagged as that because we are as a project and as I uh, say we, because it's also the feedback that's, that's given of really adapting and learning about where that goes. And that's that merge where, where there's a flow easy interface too, that's, that's one of the aspects that kind of flows in there. Gutenberg as a whole is already better across different devices. It already adapts much better, um, particularly from the experience than we've had before within WordPress. That's great, and we need to build on that. We cannot be releasing as a project WordPress itself. We cannot be releasing something that doesn't respond to different devices. I think we need to stop thinking in terms of breakpoints, though. We need to be thinking in terms of adaption and not fix points that you happen to say, oh, if it's this thing, it fits here. If it's this thing, it fits here. It moves and it adapts and, it's, and it morphs more. That's why I use the word adapt rather than responsive or breakpoints, because truly adaptive means that it will change to be the right experience on that device rather than it just meets the breakpoint and then we squish everything into that breakpoint. But there's something going on the screen, so I'm going to pass the microphone this side right now. <laughs> yeah, and the, the, so the columns block was, uh, we originally didn't plan to have it in the first version. And it was mainly a, a way for us to build the infrastructure so that any block, right now, the same way that the block columns is built, any, any third party developer can build their own blocks and have their own nested areas. And that was the main goal, that's why it took uh, it took a lot of work behind the scenes to get to a point where there's nothing particularly custom about our cu our columns block. It's mostly to get the infrastructure so anyone can build them. Um, it's We also did it in a very flat way, so you don't have column wrappers, which makes it harder to make it uh, responsive. Uh, there, there's a pull request, maybe today, later on in the workshop, we can look at it, that's actually adding wrappers to columns. Um, it should be... I think it should be easy to, to get it to a point where it, it can be uh, completely responsive. But again, we have been focusing mostly on infrastructure so that we have both nesting, we can drag and drop things in and out of the columns, um, and not so much on the actual front-end display of the columns yet. Uh, but it, but it, it should happen, I don't think it's too much. Again, we have called it columns beta so, that, so, so to set the expectations that it might not make the cut for V1. Um, but it's, I mean, I'm personally pleased with how the infrastructure went, and I think we can build, like, many different variations on this. I think there are already some, some people building their own, like, section blocks that have these kind of column areas as well, and, and, and that's, that's been kind of the main goal, to allow people to, to build this for themselves, too. Yeah, and of course, there's always tables if you need something responsive now. So, and you, you can you can you can even put tables in your columns if you want. Yeah. Uh, next question back there. Hello, I guess this is for Tammy. Um, I'm a designer, and I design for WordPress, and um, my designs then get implemented, so they've um, they're not theme-based. Um, so I was wondering what you think is the main changes that we should have in our design thinking while we are designing or when we are presenting. So obviously I know WordPress um, inside out in a design sense that when I'm presenting to clients I can um, talk about the futures or why I've, I've added a, I don't know, future post section or whatever sort of thing. So what what is the main freedom that it gives do you think the designers and um the the main leap from what we have now thank you for that question i'm going to try there was a lot in that so i'm going to try and answer no we can have a conversation so if i don't answer it fully let's like you tell me what i didn't answer and we can kind of have a conversation i think um so it's a very kind of personal thing that I think Gutenberg provides as well as a designer. And I'm really excited about going to more of a component. That's something as designers, we've the design world has moved into. 
and, and also the development world has moved into. So thinking of breaking things down into reusable components, um, pattern libraries, style, whatever you kind of direction. So I think that it provides that. I don't know if you already work with pattern libraries and style guides. If you already work that way, um, then continue that because I think WordPress is going to respond better to that now. If you're not, start doing that. Start. Um, I worked with freelance for a while, and that would be my approach now. I would have a pretty robust pattern library that I would fall back on. So that that would just be kind of like my note point. I would say there's there's more unification of the interface of WordPress, and that's been something so frustrating from a design aspect. What does this do? Where does this go? You learn one way of doing something in WordPress, and then maybe a plugin or a theme changes that, so it becomes a completely different way. So from teaching someone and from designing around it, it's like a leveling of interface. So these patterns, uh, and the hope is that we will, as a project, move those patterns across not just the editor. We're, we're going into customization, but we have an opportunity to stop the confused interactions and stop the, the cross patterns and really just provide a better base of design for the whole ecosystem that then we can benefit from. I would say start thinking about block design would be another um, exciting thing. Again, falling back because uh, I'm just trying to respond to your kind of situation. If I was still freelance, I would be working on a suite of, of blocks that I could use across different client sites. Um, I used to focus on community design, so I used to build a lot of had a buddy press sites and, and, and that would have very specific blocks I would probably use across multiple sites. So I would do that, have the structure of those, uh, and then I would be kind of looking at the design aspect. I think it's really exciting because it means that we can embrace all different types of designers within this project as well. We, yeah, so uh, did I answer or is there anything else? Because I'm happy to have like a bit of a conversation here. You are welcome, and you can find us uh, remotely as well. So it's a big building. If you don't find me now, um, I'm more than happy to discuss over the next couple of days. But also just come. This is kind of an important thing. The core editor channel is not just for developers. It's also for designers to come in. And also on make.wordpress.org, we have a design team. So come and join the design team on the Slack channel as well. And uh, also come into the core editor and ask design questions, because then I get really excited, because then I can talk to you about design. Yeah. Uh, now, to switch gears, of course, I've noticed that like all the developers on the side haven't had to answer a single question. I'm very jealous of how much they're getting kicked back. So anyone who asks a development question, which requires one of them, will get two Gutenberg stickers. That's the deal. Uh, next question, though, is, is back there, right? Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you, everyone. And Actually, I have a little general question, like, for example, for developers, I don't know, how it's gonna, how the Gutenberg is gonna affect the way theme developers trying to display content, if it's gonna affect at all, I don't know, uh, how we are going to query and display content on a page. Uh, thank you. So, do you mean, like, as in, how does a theme builder style the blocks, then? Is that what you mean? No, I mean, um, if I design a page, for example, before Gutenberg, it's most of the time it's we have a pre-designed layout of a page, and Gutenberg has a lot of uh, possibilities. So, how it's going to affect uh, the way I'm designing, uh, with the way I'm uh, actually, maybe we can talk about that. Is it going to affect the way I'm writing markup? I don't know. Uh, no, I mean, out of the box, Gutenberg, uh, in its current form, is more of a content editor. So uh, it's not any different uh, fundamentally than a post that you would create in the current editor so far as it generates HTML, which then shows up on the front of your site in wherever you use the content tag. Uh, as far as like capabilities that you are given as a, a theme designer, a theme developer to want to put some more restrictions on the types of content or the layout of content, uh, we have options already in place 
for predefined templates, for example. Uh, so if you have a custom post type or, or even for specific page layouts, maybe you can define uh, a, a set of predefined blocks. So as a, a user coming onto the editor uh, for that post type, they already see a bunch of blocks there. They just have to start filling out the information. Uh, which is really empowering for you as the theme developer because in your mind you already have some idea of what you might want that page to look like and you just want an easy way for the user to enter the information into the various areas on that page. Um, and I could, I think, uh, in one of the future iterations, maybe not for V1, but uh, is multiple page templates. So when you go to create a new page or new post, you know, you have an option of six different possible layouts for that page and then you, you you click the one that you want and fill out the information press publish and the it's already on the front of the set and again this is just this is just markup the same post content that has already existed but with this concept of a block and the, the markup that it produces uh, it, it sort of comes out of the box so you know columns already lay out in specific areas which as a theme developer is kind of hard to provide for a user to do, you know, columns layouts without really complicated short codes, for example. Uh, any more questions? We've got time for a couple more, so I'm going to probably, very quick, Matthias, very quick. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the main thing for theme is that the rendering engine is not changing. Like, it's still, like, whatever you do in Gutenberg, the theme doesn't have to do anything for that to be displayed. Themes can hook into that and completely change how blocks are visually displayed. Um, can I enable the screen? Again? Yeah, can you hold it for a second? Um, uh, to me, the, the biggest thing for theme is that, that you can start thinking, it's kind of like what Tammy said, to decompose the, your theme into these individual elements. And then, for instance, something like the author thing, you can let the user edit this directly, but at the same time, you can protect that. It's not easy to break this. Like, there's no. I can even, like, if I select the whole thing, I start selecting the entire blocks. So it's, this provides the theme, it provides the flexibility for the design to be as elaborate as you want, but allow users to edit this and be very intuitive, but at the same time protect the markup and make sure that the user cannot, cannot break the design and then have to call you again to say, oh, how can I fix this because my HTML is a mess. So it's th that's kind of the, the balance that we're trying to reach, is to expand the possibilities for themes to express these more elaborate design elements, while giving users the ability to, I can also change the image here directly, uh, to do these kind of things very quickly, and without ruining the design or without having to learn how to manipulate the markup. And right now we're just focused on the content area, but as soon as we expand to be the full theme, you can imagine everything from the site <coughs> title to the header to the menu system. All of those pieces are, can just be constructed as blocks. And that allows you to express a theme as a, basically a list of blocks with nested areas, whatever, but just as a list of blocks. And, and you will be able to choose what's editable, what's not, uh, what can be locked down, what can be open to the user. So th that's where I see the themes going to. Okay, next question. Oh Maybe my, oh, uh, you got 10 seconds. Okay, whoa, <laughs> uh, pressure. That facial expression that I was saying when someone first loads WordPress, placeholders is an answer to that. If you, rather than having just this white page of puzzlement as soon as you open up an editor, you had placeholders loaded, that suddenly becomes monumentally much more easy for someone to understand and engage with. And as someone that's made themes, that's super exciting that I can provide that experience for someone. So they don't just look at something and freeze and not know what to do. They know what to do because there's the author avatar and there's this type of content and there's these placeholders and there's this awesome information that says, hey, upload an image here. So the page starts having a conversation rather than a confusion. <laughs> Next, uh, right there. Hello, uh, first of all, thanks for making this awesome piece of uh, editor. So as a user, I n never thought that this is something I always wanted. So I'm more than happy to see Gutenberg and uh, I can say that I'm patriotic and religious to it. And as a developer, uh, I will again thank to the development team. I was a PHP developer four months back. Now I can say I am a JavaScript or React developer. It helped me push my envelope. 
uh, the question I want to ask is like uh, every morning when I go through the Slack or uh, GitHub channel. So here team is busy creating Gutenberg and world that I would want to convert into like another visual composer or something. So I just want to know your reactions because when I see that I'm like, I want to find you and I want to hug you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so, what what's the the question? So, question is, what is your reaction? Because people out there just want to convert into visual composure, DV, or Bevo. They are not looking at the Gutenberg as Gutenberg. They are not trying to see what is coming. Because I see Gutenberg as a tip of an iceberg. Like there is a lot that is coming. People don't see that. So, what would you like to convert to those people? Uh, I think this is more of a um, something that goes beyond just the Gutenberg team is more uh, us as a community, how, how we reach to those people, um, how we engage both the page builders into like seeing if this is a, um, how can users become more like, one of our biggest challenges now is that Gutenberg is mostly known within the WordCamp systems. And it's if you look at the plugin downloads, I think it's like 15,000 or something like that. Um, so we, we need to expand the reach beyond just the people, like even like how many people know that something like Gutenberg exists is a very narrow uh, amount of people that follow the WordPress development channels. So this is more, I sort of turn the question back to you all. to, the, to So so my uh, question is, like, even if people are aware, like uh, there are people who are actively into the development and all, they are following the issues. So I see even of the pull request, uh, they end up saying that, okay, Visual Composer, can do this, so why not Gutenberg? So it, the question, always everything turns around those existing uh, page builders. There is always a comparison. Well, I mean, uh, the, this this really goes back to like the, the, the V1 thing that Tammy said. Like, uh, we have to put a stop into uh, the feature free so that we can release something and actually get to those users that are not going to be following all these channels. Um, at the same time, it's, anyone is free to open a pull request to submit an idea if they were inspired by Visual Composer or by Beaver Builder and they have an idea for a blog or something else, everyone is free to open the PR. We have a lot of, I think we have like 180 open pull requests. Not all of those are going to be merged, but sometimes they are just sharing ideas, sharing how something could be done, maybe in the next version of Gutenberg. So it's, I mean, that that's a very flexible process and we're, I mean, we just need to be conscious that at some point we need to launch, and and we also need to be conscious that the longer we delay this, the more potential users of WordPress that are not going to be choosing WordPress because it's too hard for them, we're going to be losing all those users. So we need to be, we we need to make sure that we're not just for the sake of having everything we can do that we delay the project too much and we lose the sort of momentum because also it's. A lot of these things solidify when real users start using it, and you get that feedback loop, and you can sort of make, oh, maybe some of these decisions weren't the best ones, and we need to change some things, or maybe the, like, 5.1 make some revisions to the experience based on the massive amount of users that we're going to get once we launch it to, to everyone. Um, so we have to be very very aware of that the process for building this kind of product is very dialectical. We have to go to the users and back all the time. So we don't want to restrict it too much into the, like the development channels where we are now, where, I mean, we could be there forever if we want to like just build, bring in all the ideas from all the different page builders. And, but it's, again, it's totally open for people to submit ideas. I think it already happened with, uh, some people building their own blogs and then submitting things that like this could be in core or this could be like, uh, it's it's a very, I think it's a very encouraging moment for new contributors to come on board, uh, like designers as well. It's, it's, a, it's a, I think it's a very ripe opportunity for, for doing that and figuring out what should be in core, what shouldn't, and what, how the next phases would look. Okay. Not sure if that answered the question, but. Uh, okay, we have time for one I'm more just, uh, question. Uh, no, we're like this running so late. I'm just doing a quick one. <sighs> you don't hear many people who aren't developers saying, could I have Visual Composer? And I think that's important to remember. And I'm kind of underlining that point that we, we use a lot of terms, right, in this room, and we've used them today. And as a project, and 
the Slack channel for core editor is not accessed by a lot of people that day to day write content with WordPress. And we have to remember that we're not building just something that, if I was building just something my, for myself, it wouldn't work for Matthias and it wouldn't work for Gary because it would be working exactly for myself and, and it wouldn't work for anybody else on this panel, right? And it wouldn't work for you. So we have to be thinking not just in these terms of things and we have to understand our headspace is the word I use, understand our interpretation and kind of come with that and respond with that. Okay. Uh, so last question back there and then we're gonna have to take a little break. So right there, yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, I've read this book, uh, Resilient Web Design. It's from Jeremy Keith. I don't know if anyone knows it. It's uh, I would advise it for everyone. And he talks about the history of the web and how it's, it, it progressed and how this progress was possible. And he talks about backwards compatibility like browsers. Uh, if you have new HTML elements, the browser won't break. Um, if you have CSS markup that the browser doesn't know, it will just, not, just neglect it and, and go further. Um, that was one of his points and the second point was that it was very easy to start uh, to build a web page. Um, and I think WordPress is very, very much aligning with these principles. Um, but I don't think that creating blocks is very easy. Having all those workflows and build processes, it's not my favorite thing of, about this. So um, also you mentioned redesigning the, the, the theme API maybe. Uh, how do you think, so my question, uh, how do you think that uh, Gutenberg will affect WordPress popularity among designers and developers and its general popularity as a, yeah, flowing from this? Uh, so I, I absolutely agree that, um, that adding, adding build tools and uh, uh, moving to these, moder these more modern development practices can make it more complex, and certainly um, with uh, with good with like the Gutenberg plugin as it currently stands, and then also some of the changes we've made in WordPress core as well in preparation for Gutenberg, it does make it harder to to build things there. But I think the issue isn't so much that we're moving to requiring these build tools; it's that the tools themselves are not friendly. Um, the, the tools provide enormous benefit. If we, if we look at uh, the history of um, developing desktop applications and mobile applications, they've only ever used build tools. And if you're, if you're building, a, uh, building something with, uh, with Visual Studio or, I mean, Xcode isn't a great example, but it's okay. And um, uh, the, the Android, what's the Android? Android Studio. Android Studio is quite good, and these, this is because they are, they're able to draw on a long history of, um, of building, uh, of enabling a wide range of uh, people with a wide range of skills, of developers, of designers, to build these fantastic apps. And so, but we don't have that so much in the web, the web world. We saw a bit of that uh, years ago with, uh, with .NET, uh, where, when Microsoft came out with .NET, but it's never, it never really caught on. However, with with this, uh, with this move to, to uh, using uh, JSX and compi um, effectively uh, compiling JavaScript into an application, um, where we're starting to require these build tools, and that gives us a whole lot of advantages. It makes it we're we're able to um, write writing the code is easier once once you learn how to do it, um, and once the once the tools are set up, they can be invisible. So um, that's that's something I've been thinking about recently: is um, how do we make it so that if you're if you're not interested in in build tools, which I don't expect most people are, I'm kind of a nerd, but there, uh, but that's uh, it's not something that anyone should really care about how to configure Babel or uh, Webpack or anything like that. So. Um, we should be able to provide a way for people to just, uh, whether it be an whether it be an app or whether it be a uh, like some pre-built uh, templates, 
um, that you can simply just use them and go. Uh, so yes, it is, it is a step, it is a hurdle to, um, to kind of start using build tools instead of, uh, instead of what, a, what your existing process may be. Um, but it's one that I think is valuable, it's worth taking the time, and it's also a step that we're able to, that we're able to ease, that we're able to, to make it, uh, uh, not, not, to not only ease the difficulties there, but even to make, to make the process easier than it is now. Yeah, I just want to add that the like Jeremy Keith point is very dear to me. It's also why the like the foundation of blogs is really HTML, and that's been a very contentious point. But it's uh, I think it's a bet on the longevity of the web format and optimizing for the user and not for whatever is most convenient for us developers. Uh, at the same time, the, it's important to consider that the the blog structure is really a spectrum. Like, you, you would have people that are writing complicated blogs and might need their whole build system. Uh, like, if you look at uh, Yoast as a plugin, uh, they have the resources, they have complex needs, they, they might need their own build system. Uh, but it, from that point, you can also consider, like, you can, I mean, you can just write some HTML in the, in the editor now, and I'll just do it quickly. Yeah, you, you can just write some HTML, and then you can say, oh, I want to turn this into a reusable block. And then this becomes something that I can name, I can, uh, this is my marquee block. And then I can use this throughout. So basically, I've created a block here without touching code. I can use this in any page, and this will just work. Um, I can, it's, you can create any numbers of widgets this way just by using HTML. Um, I still think that uh, there's a bit of an overestimation in that HTML is easy for users to write. Uh, but I think, again, there's a spectrum. It's much easier to write HTML than complex JavaScript. Uh, so I can totally see a lot of people just, you can set up a site for a client and create a bunch of blocks on the fly just by writing HTML and converting them. You can do whatever you want here because it's just HTML. And then just make them available name them properly, and then when you go to the inserter, the user will be able to, to find all these blocks here, they can preview them. All of these are just HTML blocks that have been created, and I just have a lot of mess here, but it's like, and, and you can pre preview them here, and this is just, again, it's a, it's a very trivial way of creating blocks that doesn't get into the build system. And expanding a bit on that towards what Gary said, I think there's also an opportunity for having like an editor for blocks. So basically you'll be able to use like a, a visual editing experience where you write blocks and you're able to export them as plugins, as different blocks, be able to reach out the mobile apps, which has been really hard for WordPress developers to do. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for have a really wide spectrum from the super complexity of contributing to Gutenberg itself and, and writing these complicated blocks to all like being able to allow a theme developer to quickly come up with a new layout, package that up as a block, and export it without having to deal with any build system. All right, so that, that is a, a question that will lead into the next section. Well, Riyad wants to go really quick, though. Uh, yeah, I want to add a small thing about that. So uh, in Gutenberg, we use a lot of buzzwords, like in JavaScript, like React, Redux, Bible, or Webpack, and stuff like that. This can be like maybe frightening for people like at, at first. But um, hopefully in the next part of the workshop, we will see that uh, everyone can create a job without requiring all these tools and, and step by step like go into details about creating blogs. And hopefully it will make sense after that. And um, um, th that's it. We'll see like on the next part. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so that's going to do it for the Q&A. Uh, said it took a bit longer than I thought, but lots of people have questions. Uh, maybe take five minutes, you know, stretch your legs, walk around, whatever, come back in five minutes, and then, yeah, Matthias is actually going to give an intro to the block interface, and Jorge is going to talk about the plugin system. So that'll be in five minutes at 11, well, technically it'll be 11.23. We'll say 11.25, but come back in five-ish minutes. Thanks. Uh, okay. 
So the, the maybe next, you're the more next, familiar. Okay. Yeah. The the our plan now was to we we had basically two areas uh, to start exploring how to build blocks and share some of the some of our examples, um, and then move on to building other plugins that are not specific blocks but extending the rest of the editor interface. Uh, but we re we really want to make this as interactive as possible. We have enough people to go around the whole room. So if you have ideas for blocks that you have tried, um, actually, like if you can, whoever has tried to build a block already, if you can raise your hands, cool. So a decent amount of people. So again, it's like we we don't want to make this like just a presentation. We want this to be an actual workshop, so we can sort of rotate around. If you have ideas or suggestions, and you like, we'll start with some examples ourselves. But if you want to raise your hand and then say, oh, I, I was trying to build this, is this the best approach? Uh, what do you think about this other thing? Uh, that's the kind of interaction we want to go through. Um, and before we dive straight into the, into the, the, the block examples, um, I want to give a sort of overview of how we, how we think about blocks and how the API came to be. Um, there's a very important distinction in blocks between the what's the edit interface and what's the save interface. And this, is, uh, this has many implications, not just technically, but also in how we, how we conceive of blocks from a design point of view. Because it's what we're trying to do with the edit and save interface. And to be clear, uh, for those that haven't built blocks, when you're registering a blog, you have to define how the edit interface in the editor is going to look and behave. And you have to define what's going to be the markup save and render finally to the to the end user. And those two things are inherently separate. Like some very basic blocks, like a separator, is just an HR in the editor and just an HR in the front end. But it doesn't have to be. Like you could imagine the separator having a resize handler so you can make the separator line wider or you can uh, I don't know, have hooks to change the colors or change the style. Like there could be more UI in the edit interface than what the final result would be. So we want people to start thinking about blogs from the point of view of how users interact with the content and not so much from the old short code mentality, which is, okay, the edit interface is just going to be a text instruction to say the short code type, some attributes, and then where we put most of the work is in the rendering mechanism behind the block. Uh, we really want people to focus on the experience of how users interact with the content. Um, an extreme example might be the gallery block, where the markup for the, if you look at the block in, in core for a gallery, there's a lot of different elements. Like the, the final output is very simple. It's, I think it's a div with some figure elements and the image tags. But in the edit interface, you have, you're have you able to uh, remove images, to add new images, to change the columns, to change, uh, you'll be able to drag and drop to reorder the images. And all of that is like, it's a completely different interface than what the final output would be. Um, so just, just keep that in mind as we walk through, is to think about what are the possibilities or, or what's the best way for users to interact with this content. And that also leads to the other uh, main point of Gutenberg, which is direct manipulation. It's very, we've seen it already that it's very easy to think of blocks as a static preview, and you have most of your attributes in the sidebar. So what you, like you just have this preview, and then you go to the sidebar, and you manipulate, you enter the attributes, and that gets reflected in real time. But that's not what we want to optimize for. We want, if you have attributes, text, titles in the block itself, like the author block I was showing, that, that should be directly editable in the editor. Like, as much as possible should be happening on the block itself, because that's where the cognitive burden is the least for the user, because they just see the text, they edit it, they see a placeholder for an image, they can drag an image there and just have it working. Um, some, some things do belong in the cyber, more of the like advanced attributes if you want to add a class name, uh, so there's still room for that. Uh, but I think it's very important for everyone to think about how can we consolidate all the functionality in the block itself. Uh, another example is caption fields for images. It could be just an attribute on the sidebar, but it's better if you just 
bake it, it into the block itself so that when the user selects it, they see, oh, there's a placeholder here for a caption, and they immediately know where the caption is going to be rendered because it's visually in context with the whole block. Um, so yeah, that's that's about it, and we'll we'll start walking through some of the examples. Uh, and again, we want to please if you have if you have ideas or or something it's not clear or you want to share an experience, raise your hands and yes. Uh, we do. Hi. Um, uh, we work with. Uh, bigger companies that have a lot of employees uh, changing content. And I was wondering if there's a way to freeze <laughs> the flexibility. I mean, Gutenberg is great because it's flexible. Uh, but is there a way maybe on, on user role a level to say, OK, this is a template that we're going to use and create a blog page or a landing page or whatever? Is, is, there, any, is there anything coming when it comes to that? So, so on, on one hand, the templates definition that you can register for Gutenberg already support locking. You can lock in so that people cannot add new content. You can lock it completely down so they cannot even reorder blocks. They can just edit the blocks themselves. Uh, there are some issues about how to lock individual blocks if you want to. Um, I mean, a very if you're just creating custom blocks and you don't make the field editable, that's locked. So it's uh, that's another way of handling it, uh, but it's uh, we can probably show some of the template stuff in in a bit. Uh, do you have something ready for templates there? I have 